America, the world's greatest democracy, and at its heart, the vote, the will of the people. But how do you know if the vote is counted correctly? And if you don't know, then what have you got? Democracy? This is the story of a small group of citizens headed by a grandmother from Seattle. They set out on a journey to ask one simple question. How does America count its votes? What they found was secrecy, votes in the trash, and how to change the course of history. When people see what's really going on, there is no way we will allow this to continue. Back in 2000, Al Gore lost the presidential election in Florida amongst the chaos and arguments over how to recount the votes. But no one thought to ask how the computers originally counted the results. As dusk fell on election night, one official noticed something very strange, a sign that the heart of America's democracy was in danger. In Volusia County, Florida, an election computer counted Al Gore's totals backwards. He had negative votes. It was showing a minus sign in front of the votes that it had subtracted from Gore. I mean, it wasn't like it was trying to hide it. It says there's minus 16,022 votes here. How could a computer that is supposed to protect the votes of you and me count backwards to give a candidate negative votes? Either it was an error or someone had tried to rig the election. There was an investigation into the negative votes, and it was established that the problem couldn't have been due to machine failure, because only the totals for the presidential race were affected. It looked like a second memory card may have been loaded onto the computer. Memory cards contain the votes, but this second card had disappeared, so they couldn't check it. The origin of the negative votes was never proved but some engineers thought that it might have been an attempt to tamper with the election. But no one will ever know for sure. The software that counted those votes was owned by Global Election Systems. In 2002, they were bought by the Diebold Corporation. The software is a trade secret. It's against federal and state law to look inside Diebold's voting machines. I was the chief technical advisor to the Secretary of State of the largest state in the United States, and I was not allowed to look at the software running in Diebold or any other vendor's voting systems. To this day, I have not been allowed to look at that software. Software like this is installed in more than 30 states. If someone tampers with it or it just malfunctions, then the wrong people can win elections. If that happens, hundreds of representatives, judges, and other officials may hold offices they are not elected to. Democrat or Republican, it affects us all. Bev Harris lives in Seattle with her family. A writer, publicist, and grandmother, she knew nothing about computer programming or election systems. But when her county bought a new touchscreen system, she started to ask questions. The answers she got reveal a system in crisis. You know, I had a life before I did this, and I never really envisioned uh, becoming any kind of an activist or advocate. But sometimes something comes into your life and you know, well, if I don't do it, then maybe no one else will, and then maybe I don't want to bequeath that to my children. 
I put three words into a news search engine, voting machines and glitch, and found dozens and dozens of elections that were miscounted by the machines. And about that time, I thought, we really have a problem. What Bev had found was that you couldn't necessarily rely on the election results produced by voting machines. In Louisiana, Susan Berniker, a Republican candidate, filmed the proof when she went to check her results on a touchscreen computerized voting system. This is where I came the day that the uh, warehouses are open to the candidates to inspect. So I came here with an old college buddy. He grabbed his camera and I asked him to show me how the machine worked. So I just started fooling around with the machine. And it's when I press the button next to my name, and then I look down and I see Mr. Gambaluka's name in the display when I press Susan Bernecker. Shall we do it again? Do it again. Yeah. OK, here we go again. I'm pressing Bernecker. Gambaluka shows up. So we went down the row. We probably mm -hmm. tested 15 machines. And I said, you know what? We don't have to test anymore. And that is when I said, oh my goodness, what, this is terrible. We can't count our votes. So how do we know this is right? Because the casting of the vote is secret, it's rare to get documentary evidence of machines miscounting. But Susan's experience isn't an isolated problem. Computers count around 80% of America's votes. It's the counties that run elections and buy voting machines. So the make and model varies from place to place, but there are two major types. On a touchscreen machine, the software counts the selections you make on the screen. Optical scan machines read a paper ballot that you have voted on. Seven o'clock, polls are closed. The votes themselves are stored on the computer's memory cards. This is the voter cartridge. This cartridge is very important, and it goes right into our bag. There it is. These memory cards are taken to a master computer, sometimes called the central tabulator, which reads the votes, adds them up, and then declares the winner. The problem is that you can't see a computer adding up the votes. So how do you know if it's counted correctly? Suppose that we didn't have any computers at all. And when you went to vote, the voting booth was separated by a curtain, and there was a guy behind the curtain who would write down your votes. So you just dictate them, he writes them down, and when you're done, you leave without being able to look at the ballot. Most people in their right mind would not trust this process. The guy behind the curtain could be incompetent, he could hear your votes wrong and record them improperly, or it could be that he doesn't like your political affiliation and would prefer to see your votes cast for someone else. In an electronic voting machine, you don't have a little guy inside the machine taking dictation, but you have lots of people who are involved in writing the software and lots of people who could have touched the software before it went into that machine. If one of those people puts something malicious in the software and it's distributed to all the machines, then that one person could be responsible for the change of possibly tens of thousands of votes, maybe even hundreds of thousands across the country. That's a very dangerous situation. You know, I began looking into these voting machines, and one reason I was so curious is because it's a secret how they work. The companies that make them keep it a secret, none of the computer scientists felt they could even look at the code because the code was supposed to be a secret. The certification labs that examine it keep their process a secret of what they do, and even the election officials who buy the equipment are prohibited by their contract from ever looking and seeing how it works. What happened next really changed my life. I was looking for technicians who could perhaps answer some questions of mine, and while I was looking for technicians, I stumbled upon an obscure web page the web page was an old uh, predecessor of the Diebel election systems page. And I clicked the link. And that link took me to a site that was not a web page, but it was more like a library or an online filing system. And it contained a, a bunch of different files, just like you see on your computer. And within those were more files, and within those were more files. And 
the files were amazing. They were things like the software specifications, the software itself, the drawings for the hardware, the user manuals, passwords in some cases. It was the crown jewels for Diebold election systems. Bev didn't know it, but what she'd just found was a computer program called GEMS. GEMS, made by the Diebold Corporation, counts around 40% of America's votes. So I began downloading these files, and throughout the night, I continued to download them. Throughout the weekend, I continued to download them. There were so many files, it took about 40 hours to download all the files there were. And then I knew I would be working on this project for a long, long time. Up to this point, only the voting machine companies knew how America's elections were actually counted. When Bev downloaded the Diebold software, the wall of secrecy began to crumble. The Diebold Corporation claimed that Bev had stolen the software from their FTP internet site. The FTP site was an unfortunate situation, I admit to that. It was a situation where that information was out there, it was captured, which was our fault. We made a mistake, and we readily admit that. Will it happen again? No, it will not. I had never looked at software code in my life. But as a writer, one thing you learn to do is ask a whole lot of questions and learn as much as you can about things. I will say that I didn't want to go through it. I thought, you know, maybe I can cover this story without really learning how it works, but it wasn't to be. I had to actually learn how it works. After finding the files, you know, I sort of collected together some various computer scientists or computer programmers who could help me understand them. And Avi Rubin did an amazing study with three colleagues of his. I got a call that the Diebold code was on the web. Uh, Bev Harris had found it on Diebold's own site. And so, you know, did I want to analyze it? And I said, sure. You know, I was very excited about the opportunity to analyze Diebold's code. And I think it's the first chance anyone had ever had on the outside to see what's going on inside of these electronic voting machines. Dr. Rubin found that you could hack into an election without even knowing how the system worked. The problem that Bev has discovered is, is a pretty significant security hole, and it does open the way for people uh, to really seriously manipulate the election in a way that's very difficult to detect. But it wasn't just the Diebold machines that were a concern. Sequoia, ESNS, and Diebold uh, have the lion's share of the market. In fact, ESNS and Diebold alone have about 80% of the electronic voting market. The state of Maryland had spent $55 million on a Diebold election system. They asked computer consultants Raba Technologies to test it. Raba were able to break into the machines in around 10 seconds. I mean, what do they spend the $55 million on? Accuracy and security and reliability of the equipment. Again, there's a perception there. And well, it's I more than a perception. I mean, these scientists broke into the machine. I will tell you from what I read in the robber report, and I've read it very carefully, is that the steps that they took and how they, they stated that they had affected the machine in an environment of an actual election would be virtually impossible. Most states require that the voting systems be tested by independent testing authorities, or ITAs. But if the machines had been tested, then why were there so many security flaws? And why could they count votes backwards? It seems I have friends, both in private industry, working for these companies and working in government, that I don't know about and don't know who they are, who know there's something wrong. They're disturbed by what they see, and they want people to know what's going on. What I have obtained here, and these are hard to get your hands on, are two reports. One is for Vote Here, one is for Diebold GEM System. They're both from cyber which is an independent testing authority, they have these extensive charts 
where they go over all of the different regulations in the FEC guidelines and they have check mark after check mark saying that yes, they, they pass, they pass, they pass, they pass. Both of them are the same. You get to the last page and there's a check mark in the other column. Something wasn't tested. And what was not tested is the security of the system. This is the test that tells us whether these things can be tampered with. And here I have penetration analysis not reviewed by Software ITA. Bev founded blackboxvoting.org, a not-for-profit organization dedicated to consumer protection for elections. She published the results of her investigations on her website. Andy Stevenson, a candidate for Secretary of State in Washington, read her findings and decided to contact her. I was still actually running for office. And my reaction was, is, <laughs> bleep, <laughs> I'm screwed. <laughs> Bev and I couldn't get any answers from our public officials, no matter how much we hounded them. It was just impossible. So we decided on our own to, to go get the answers. Bev and Andy joined forces. They wanted to know why voting equipment wasn't being tested for security and why it could count backwards. We set out to meet Sean Southworth in Huntsville, Alabama. He is the uh, tester of equipment and software for all the major manufacturers of voting equipment. Something's broken. Just do what you do best, darling. Andy was wired with a small camera. He and Bev wanted to be sure that their conversation with Sean Southworth was properly recorded, word for word. I'm uh, looking for Sean Southworth. That's you. I just had a couple questions. Um, to be that tests all these things. It's cyber. Cyber is the one that's a critic. That's who you need to be asking these questions. Well, no, um, it's actually you. Because no. your name is on all of the documents. Now, all we do is in the FEC guidelines. That's what we do. And we write a report. We test the software, we review the code to the FEC standard, and then we write a report. We don't certify, we don't recommend, we don't say, this is the best stuff you've ever seen in your right. life. We write that report. And then how, how do you deal with something where it accepts negative or minus votes? We don't. Doesn't that sound, you don't, you just go ahead and write a report? We you write it in your report if, if that's a concern? If you ask the EAC, who you should be talking to is who we write the reports for. We can't disclose our report to anybody. Right, and, and my question is, do on we, minus votes, we because put, we now know that that happens. Do we put things in there that have that kind of burden? No. I don't know of any time that I've ever put a report out that would say that, because first of all, any time, any time we write a report, the system is going through the testing. And first of all, the vendor's not going to want a report that has something negative in it. Okay. So they will retest and retest and retest and retest and retest until they make it right, until we get everything in there that is done to the standard. Then we write a report. So if cyber claims the machines passed the tests for accuracy and security, then why are they capable of counting backwards? And why can someone break into them in 10 seconds? What people are saying is, why should they trust these machines? I, can, I think the main reason is because everything is tested before it's ever deployed for an election. And I, it sounds like I'm a broken record, keep going back to that, but that's a very important step. Bev continued her trip across the states. It was clear that the official records weren't going to reveal anything. So Bev started to raid the trash of the voting machine companies and their customers, the counties. She was joined in her dumpster diving campaign by Kathleen Wynn, an activist from Cleveland, Ohio. Have mercy, that was fun and it smells delicious. 
I mean, it's a hit or miss. It's like shopping. You never know what you're going to get until you go. And you open it up and go, okay, nothing. But you never, this looks like a possibility. I think what we'll want to do is get to some place where it looks like we can be fairly undisturbed, you know, behind a supermarket or something. Bev and Kathleen made dozens of raids. Uh, it's legal. When they put documents out in a dumpster in public areas, it's uh, perfectly legal to go get them because they're no longer protecting them. We wouldn't have to do this if our system wasn't secret and hadn't been turned over to private corporations. Digital camera. And unfortunately, what their inner workings are is the votes of you and I, citizens of America. On July 11, 2004, during a raid on Diebold's own trash in McKinney, Texas, Kathleen found some of Diebold's internal accounts. Um, this is some of the stuff that we found actually in McKinney, Texas, in the Diebold trash. Uh, I found an accounts receivable ledger. And in the accounts receivable ledger, I was interested to see the top item was actually money due to Diebold from the 8th District Republican Committee. Now that's interesting because this is not an elections office that owes Diebold, which would make sense because they've purchased election systems. It, it's a Republican political committee paying Diebold. We have a right to ask why they are collecting receivables from the Republican committee. Bev and Kathleen don't know what this item meant. What is known is that Diebold and some of its executives were major Republican fundraisers. In 2003, Walden Odell, the CEO of Diebold, had written a fundraising letter promising to deliver the votes of Ohio to George W. Bush. It's important that your company is impartial, isn't it? Yes. So why did your chief executive say I am committed to delivering Ohio's vote to George W. Bush in 2004? That quotation that appeared in the letter is something that uh, he regrets. It's a situation where his personal preference has come over into his, his business practice and uh, he has committed to, to keeping a much lower profile when it comes to those types of activities because of that statement. You know, people talk about partisan ties to the voting companies and they're right. That being said, we're also seeing that it's not quite as simple a picture. We have the state of Maryland and the state of Georgia have Democrats very tightly wed to use of the Diebold system, and it's the Republicans who are fighting against it there. And in my own home county, Seattle, King County, Washington, it's the Democrats who are pushing these systems and the Republicans who are a little bit skeptical. The new battleground was California the center of the computer industry. And the Secretary of State, Kevin Shelley, was getting worried about security. Well, in 2003, Kevin Shelley discovered that one of the counties was running uncertified software. And so he ordered an audit of all of the county's voting machines in California. And he discovered that none of them were using certified software. They later even acknowledged that they were aware of the law but even though they were aware of the law, they chose to ignore it, and they made those changes without seeking prior approval, which is a direct violation of state law. That's when I first came to realize uh, Diebold's uh, uh, lack of uh, integrity uh, as a company. Diebold was called to account by the state of California. At stake was millions of dollars worth of business, and Diebold was forced to put their president, Bob Urosevich, on the stand. As you know, uh, about a year ago, one version of the source code of the Diebold TSX system escaped your control and some months later was investigated by uh, a group headed by Avi Rubin, Professor Avi Rubin of Johns Hopkins University, and they wrote a report which found numerous severe vulnerabilities in uh, the code that they saw. I would like your general reaction to those reports before we go a little more deeply. Basically, the code was stolen. In there is passwords. In there is our encryption technology. Okay, now, you know, we're not, I'm not a rocket science, but let me tell you, if somebody steals the key to my house, 
the first thing I'm going to do is probably change the lock. So that's what we went ahead and did. I'm mean, sorry. Exactly As you know, the code wasn't stolen. It was left on a public FTP site by, by the, your own the, company. The, the code was lifted off of our site, sir, and we still believe it was Downloaded stolen. Downloaded from, un, what, 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 you know that. Okay. Now, of course, the source code, in fact, got out. The key is now published. Uh, what, in fact, what in effect you did, or your, your team did, is, is create a big complex building, put locks on every door, use the same key for every lock, and then published a picture of the, uh, of the key on the wall. Uh, this was far below the minimal standards of security. But for Bev, there was a more basic problem than security. Could Diebold be trusted at all with the counting of the vote? On topic number one, Diebold, we have a company that lies. Yes, I'll say it, lies. Up here this morning, they were saying they'd made all the changes in the software to fix the multiple flaws that would have never been found in the beginning if I hadn't have found their files on the website, by the way. But you see, there's something called release notes. It's a legal document. It is something that must show everything you did and did not change when you put out a new version. I obtained the release notes for GEMS. They did not fix any of the problems. This stuff was never corrected. I don't know what to say. How can you have a company say, we want secret software that nobody, even the county registrars who are here testifying on their behalf, is allowed to look at? And when you look at it, you find flaws. And then they say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. So you turn it over to scientific panels. They find flaws. They say, oh, don't worry about it. We corrected it. And that's a lie. Bob Yurusevich, Diebold's president, did offer this statement defending Diebold election systems also known as DESI. DESI understands that the SOS, the Secretary of State and the voting panel are disappointed in the fact that the RNG Associates inventory report identified unqualified and uncertified software and are looking at DESI to acknowledge that this should not have happened. To be clear, there was no improper intent or motive on DESI's part to give rise to this situation. At the outset, I want to be crystal clear that these allegations of this report about Diebold's deceiving are not true and are factually not supported. A few days later, Kevin Shelley, the Secretary of State of California, announced the consequences for Diebold. I am decertifying the Diebold TSX system, banning its use in four counties where it is installed. Furthermore, I have taken the additional step, and I have the letter here just signed upstairs, of asking the Attorney General to pursue criminal and civil actions against Diebold in this matter, based on findings of fraudulent actions. We will not tolerate deceitful tactics as engaged in by Diebold. Don't try to pull a fast one on the voters of California, because there will be consequences if you do. The state brought a civil action against Diebold, but never pursued criminal charges. The lawsuit was eventually settled for a payment by Diebold of $2.6 million. Bev was clearly hitting the industry's profitability, and she got legal threats. It was, it was truly a difficult time, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, it kind of can make and break a marriage. I was very lucky that my husband was absolutely behind this, because you know, here we're looking at each other going, not only do we have no money, but we could get sued by the vendors because they think their stuff needs to be secret, and we could lose everything. And he simply said, you know, my family's been fighting for the right to vote. My husband's African American. He said, my family's been right, fighting for the right to vote for six generations, and we're not going to stop now. In California, it was only the touchscreens that had been decertified. The central tabulating software, GEMS, was still in use. Now, the central tabulator is sort of the one machine to rule them all. It collects all the votes. And every company, not just Diebold, has this central tabulator. Because, of course, the way you vote is you vote in individual precincts. They're scattered around. And there has to be one machine to pull all these threads together, add them all up, and pronounce the winner. 
Bev wanted to find out if GEMS was really keeping the votes secure. And so she turned to computer security expert, Dr. Hugh Thompson. I was at this massive hacker slash computer security conference. And I get approached by this grandmotherly figure. And, and she tells me that, hey, I've got access to the tabulation software from one of the biggest electronic voting manufacturers on the planet. I'm like, wow, that's very interesting. And then she says, can you take a look at it for me? I'd say the thing that shocked me was how easy vote totals could be changed. So imagine you can go into a box and essentially rewrite history. And there's no record of you rewriting history. And the only record of history itself is the thing that you changed. And that's pretty scary to me. Bev and Hugh worked out a way to demonstrate the insecurity of GEMS. She was invited to appear with her computer hack on national TV with former presidential candidate, Governor Howard Dean. All right, Bev, show me how to do this. Well, what we have here is the central tabulator computer. Now, in a voting system, you have all these different voting machines at all the different polling places. All those machines feed into the one machine so it can add up all the votes. So, of course, if you were going to do something you shouldn't to a voting machine, would it be more convenient to do it to the 4,000 machines or to just come in here to one machine and, and deal with all of them at once? The GEMS program is the program that is the central tabulator program. And I'm going to put in a password here. Okay, we're in. Now, this is the official program that the county supervisor sees. As we can see here, Howard Dean has 1,000 votes. And Lex Luthor has 500, so you're beating Lex Luthor, and we're... Two quite, to one. Yes, and Tiger Woods, unfortunately, doesn't have any votes yet. All right. All right, let's close this out. I was just showing you the legitimate way to go in and look at votes, which, All of right. course, you can't tamper with. Go to the Start menu, and I'm going to show you something tricky. And I want you to go to My Computer and just click that. And you're going to see some... Come up, go to Local Disk C, and go to Program Files. Go to Central Tabulator Votes, and then go to the sum of the candidates, which is that table. You see we have 800 votes here for you and 400 for Lex Luthor. Let's just flip those. We'll make that 400, and we'll give 100 votes to Tiger. Let's just see what happened here. We'll go back into GEMS the legitimate way. And as you can see now, Howard Dean only has 500 votes. Lex Luthor has 900, and Tiger Woods has 100 votes. Mm. We just edited an election, it took us 90 seconds. Diebold and election officials all over the U.S. still insisted that their systems were secure. They said that despite Bev's GEMS hack, there were checks and balances, and that inconsistencies in vote totals would be detected in an actual election. This was just two months before one of the closest presidential elections ever. Those checks and balances those were about to be tested. Oh my goodness, you're getting so big. Feel great, thank you. Let me go vote first. Let's go. Okay, let's see if I can follow instructions. The world watches our great democracy function. All right, I'll put you down for a second, sweetie. It's that magic moment when the greatest democracy on the face of the planet gets to show the world how we work. It would be nothing better for our system for, um, for the election to be conclusively over tonight so that, uh, I think it's going to be me, so I can go on and, and uh, lead this country. The politicians said everything was fine, but it wasn't. The machines weren't just insecure. They malfunctioned, leaving thousands without a vote. And now, nobody knows. On election day in, in 2004, um, we, like a lot of other organizations, had a voter helpline where people could call in and let us know the problems that they were experiencing. We logged in over 200,000 calls, and many of those people left a voice recording of what they actually experienced. When I made my selection, it jumped from the square that I touched to the square above. They said half the machines were broken. There was one voting booth, one, for 3,000 people. Seven and a half hours in line to vote. And they put two machines 
in another area with only 300 people and gave us two machines with 3,000 people. And they have a lot more in the outlying, richer communities, and they don't have lines there. I am hardly around the first of the three rooms that I have to wait. The line is out to the street. Four to five hour wait, you, you can't do. You can't do that. Women with children having to stand outside in the pouring down rain. There were a lot of people who ended up not being able to vote uh, because they just couldn't stay in those lines. There were a lot of elderly people there. It is not the people who do the choosing. Everything is so fixed. It's so fixed. There is a calamity going on out there about how elections are conducted in this country. And it results in less voter participation and potentially um, a lack of accuracy in who's either elected or what decisions are made in the polling places. As the precincts closed, the poll workers switched the machines to reporting mode, signed off on the results, and took the memory cards to the central tabulating computers. Well, let me see. America waited for the computers to give the official results. Go to John first. Karen Hughes sounding pretty upbeat right now, John. What are you hearing? But look, no Republican has ever won the White House without winning Ohio. That is a cliche. We repeat it a lot, but it also happens to be true. They've always said yes, Wisconsin and Iowa. If you look at the voting returns coming in right now, the latest I brought up a few minutes ago, I believe Senator Kerry has a narrow lead in both states. I didn't turn on the TV for the election results, and I didn't turn on the radio. Instead, I sat here filling out 3,000 Freedom of Information requests to go to every county in the United States to obtain the internal audit logs of those computers, knowing that we wouldn't get them for weeks after the election, and that it would probably be certified and they would say, get over it, move on. And we would never know whether our election was controlled by 100 million voters or by one guy sitting in his grandmother's basement. Black box voting needed the logs of all activity on the voting machines so that they could conduct an investigation for the people. They wanted the vote count to be independent from partisan politics. In America, it is vital that every vote count and that every vote be counted. But the outcome should be decided by voters, not a protracted legal process. I would not give up this fight if there was a chance that we would prevail. But it is now clear that even when all the provisional ballots are counted, which they will be, there won't be enough outstanding votes for us to be able to win Ohio. And therefore, we cannot win this election. People were stunned. John Kerry had promised to challenge the machines and amassed a network of lawyers to protect the votes. And then, Kerry stopped any investigation by conceding, less than 12 hours after the polls had closed. Cliff Arnebeck, an Ohio election attorney spoke with John Kerry shortly after. A call from Senator Kerry comes into the hotel room, which a group of us are there meeting with uh, Reverend Jackson. Reverend Jackson puts his phone on the table, hits speaker, and we're now in a conversation. The first part of the conversation is a dialogue between counsel and Kerry. And part of that dialogue includes Kerry sharing the fact that in New Mexico, no matter what the demographics of the, of the jurisdiction are, if, it, if the votes are being counted by optical scan machines, they're coming out for Bush. This is, to anyone who's familiar with the situation, this means Kerry knows there's fraud in that election. And the optical scan machines are the clue 
Yeah, he's what he's saying is that it's the, the the optical scan machines are being rigged to produce a result for Bush, contrary to what the voters the votes the voters are casting. So this is not our conspiracy theory. This is not something we have to prove to Kerry. Kerry is sharing this as a matter of fact. Because Kerry conceded the incredible resources that he had organized for potential post-election litigation was not in the picture. Kerry conceded, even though the results were from software he knew could be rigged, and the independent exit polls had predicted his victory. Now it was clear that the citizens would have to investigate the election themselves. Another four, uh, 4 a.m. Bev and black box voting decided to start in Volusia County, Florida, where Al Gore had received his negative votes in 2000. Bev wanted to start by checking the printed results from each voting machine. Um, our election, I thought, went extremely well, and I'm very tickled about it because it was my final election to perform. I'll be retiring on December 31st. So you can imagine how I was praying to come out with a smooth election at the end. <laughs> I have one question. Um, these are not copies of the signed ones. These are new ones. Can you give out the, the signatures first of all? Now, one of the things we had asked for was the voting machine results tapes, copy of them, signed by the poll worker for election day, which was November 2nd. But the date was November 15th. And they were printed out minty fresh just for us, obviously. So what I was given was not at all what I asked for. Let me check with them. Great. Lana, the, um, the original tapes off of the machines, are they still out in the warehouse, or did you bring those in at the warehouse? They're out in the warehouse. We went to the Volusia County Warehouse because we had learned that that's where the real poll tapes or results tapes from the voting machines were going to be. And we wanted to go there by surprise because we wanted to see what they were doing with them. To see what the machines had done with the votes, Bev needed to check the printed poll tapes from all the optical scan machines. If you add up all the poll tapes and there is a mismatch with the official results, then you know there's either been a mistake or vote tampering. Call on and call the sheriff's department. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and get the news over here. Guys, you should call me. Ballots, secrecy envelopes, full tapes. Do you have a public records request for these? I don't feel too good about the fact that they're being thrown away. Show me a ballot. Oh, you're flipping out over a sample ballot. Excuse me, go call the teacher. Call on. And in fact, I'll submit a public records request for everything in this bag right now formally, and that way we can look through it and we can give back to you, them, and we'll be on our way. You are going to pick up this garbage. Sure, aren't we are. Absolutely. Do you need any bags? Well, I'm going to grab these poll tapes, which I have an active public records request for, and I've had all kinds of problems nope. getting them from the county. You didn't get that poll tape from in that bag. I sure did. And videotape. What is it? No. Nope. No, I, I'm not going to. I'll be right back. No. Nope. Probably. It's just, not the only one. I got others. Basically, you're stuff. making a uh, molehill, uh, a mountain. You know, when you when you behave secretively, that's it's, what happens. No, it's no secretive. Do I come to your place of work and ask to see everything? You're a public employee, and this is of an election. There's, there's, there's nothing secretive. You can dig away. <laughs> Good, we will. There, there's nothing in there for you to find that's going to, you know, there's no expose here. But if it makes you money, that's fine. Nobody's making money. We're auditing. And these aren't zero tapes, by the way. They have votes on them. Okay. So we're going to have, go ahead and pull all these and get copies of them. These were found at the warehouse in the garbage, and these are signed poll tapes, signed off by the poll workers. Throwing poll tapes away is against federal law. 
They have to be kept for at least 22 months after an election. Hard to figure they would throw something like this away without noticing. But we did. That's what counts. Oh, counts. <laughs> the county didn't want to investigate. They stuck to their line that the election had gone flawlessly, so there was no need. But we have a significant anomaly, too. I don't know what anomaly you're talking about, so I'm not agreeing that there's any anomaly. Well, the poll in place tape that's signed that was found in the garbage. I would think that as the supervisor of elections, you would be very concerned about this, frankly. Um, I mean, you can't throw away polling place tapes from November 2nd that are signed by six poll workers and put them in the shredder. I think we all understand that. Bev decided to go through the poll tapes Dini had given them and compare them with the original signed ones. We had asked for the signed poll tapes and they didn't give them to us, so we're looking at them now and they don't match the ones you guys gave us. So okay. this is a big discrepancy. Okay. On the 215A00, um, signed. Signed. Mm hmm. Uh, the number of votes for uh, Bush are 520. On the A01, it's 211. And that's a big, big discrepancy. You're hundreds of votes off between what we were given and what was signed. Okay, that's fine. We're going to put it back. Yeah, that one. This is fine. Okay. So this is 9 0. One. Okay. <clears throat> so, what is your one that you're working on right now? 723A01. Meanwhile, round the back of the county offices, two sharp-eyed local residents were investigating. That's amazing. That's amazing. Hi, I'm, I'm Susan Pinchon, and I'm the executive director of the Florida Fair Elections Coalition, and I am going through the trash at the Supervisor <laughs> of Elections office in Deland, Florida. Oh, my God, look at this. Look at this. All right. Let me, let me take this stuff over. Now. You'll look at later and you'll understand it. Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> these are polling tapes, and actually, one of these tapes are the ones that we were missing from this morning. This is great! You found the missing tapes! <laughs> the garbage! I'm in Volusia County, Florida. Home of, the, home of the negative vote totals. A third of the original records were either missing or incomplete. And so once again, the votes remained secret. If Volusia County was a bank and threw away the documents that added up money instead of votes, then the feds would have investigated immediately. But the feds stayed away and while black box voting was able to show the secrecy itself, no one knew what the results really were. Our democracy could go out of business. We won't have a republic left. It won't be recognizable if we don't get rid of the secrecy. It was not set up to be a secret system. It became a secret system. And if we don't open this thing up again and quickly, we will never again see what's going on. We've given it up. We've lost it. We're going to have to go back in there and take this back by whatever means necessary. Free vote, Ohio! Free vote, Ohio! In Ohio, citizens were angry claiming that the election had been fraudulently counted and that voters had been turned away illegally. They needed a recount. In the end, it was the Green Party's presidential candidate, David Cobb, who decided enough was enough. I launched a recount in order to investigate the allegations of voter suppression and fraud that were pouring in. This was a chance for black box voting to really find out how the votes are counted. And Kathleen went back to her hometown, Cleveland, in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. In the promised land, a broken promise. In the promised land, something broken in the promised land. Being that this was.
was December, January when the recount was going on. The snow uh, and blizzards and traffic, we, we, we would laugh and say, well, you know, this is what we have to do to get our democracy back. We'll do it, uh, although we would rather be home <laughs> in front of the fireplace. Cleveland, in Cuyahoga County, is the largest jurisdiction in Ohio, with around one million voters, large enough to alter the outcome of the presidential election, a swing county in a swing state. What are you getting up so early for today, and what are you going to go do today? Count the votes and make sure they're counted right. The reason that I bought a camera is irrefutable proof. I didn't ever want to be misunderstood or misquoted, so that way there'd be no question. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Right. Let me just introduce a couple of individuals. Uh, one of those individuals is Jackie Maiden, who is our elections coordinator. Uh, the ballot manager, who is Kathy Dreamer here also, who will be facilitating. <laughs> Cuyahoga was still using punch card ballots, counted by a computer running secret software. The only way of checking this computer's results is to hand count the ballots. Under Ohio law, however, you must first hand count a random 3% sample. You are only required to recount all the votes if that sample doesn't match the computer results. Tell me how you feel about this today. Well, it's, it's exciting. Like you said, it's part of history. You know, it just, um, we do recounts all the time. It's not um, that big of an issue for us. It's just for the public to see it. Recounts are not just for the public to see. The public is meant to check that the election results are correct. After all, it's their vote. Almost immediately, the observers suspected that someone had tampered with the ballots. It seems like all the Bush and the Kerry seem to be like clumped together. So there might have been some pre-sorting. Somehow those uh, cards were manipulated so that they were grouped. And I don't know anything about how that happened. Nobody's been able to answer that question for me. We've got about two more hours worth of work on hand counted ballots. And that's it? And then we'll continue to run through the tabulation machine. And they're starting to inspect poll books. And everything's going very well. Great, thank you. And I did manage to capture all the election officials saying, everything's running smoothly, everything's going perfectly. So whenever they say that, you know, <laughs> they've done something to, to make certain of that. Later, the county prosecutor charged that staff had counted a large number of precincts in secret before the public recount. Then they kept back the ballots that didn't add up, giving the citizens a 3% sample that wasn't random and wasn't legal. What's the process by which the 3% of precincts for the hand Just count? Just 3% is a random, random pick to make the number. Um, oh, how do you do the number, random pick? To make the number. Yeah. We just, we just pick. We're just trying to get to the number. Okay. And who, who's here. the person that makes that decision? Ms. Driver and her staff. <laughs> yeah. And her you staff. Do? So okay. when you, it's not really staff. truly random then. No. Our random is our random. Right. And that we have that option to select. Yeah. Okay. And that's just, I mean, we've always selected. This department has always selected what precincts we're going to use. Jackie Maiden later stated that she had been following the normal procedure in pre-sorting the ballots. However, she also said that to her knowledge, there was no discarding of any precincts which did not add up, and she did not believe this had occurred. But the other 97% of the ballots were never recounted, and no one knows if the software had added those votes correctly. The recount is nothing but a charade. It's a complete and utter waste of time. It's a, it's a bit of theater, uh, if you will, uh, and it was done, in my opinion, to ensure that there was never an actual recount conducted, but more importantly, to ensure that there was never an investigation into the underlying allegations of voter suppression and election fraud that took place. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the well-known and great state of Ohio 
seems to be regular, inform, and authentic, and it appears therefrom that George W. Bush of the state of Texas received 20 votes for President Dick Cheney of the state of Wyoming received 20 votes for Vice President. For what purpose does the member from Ohio rise? I said, I object to the Ohio vote. And before they could ask me, I said, and I do have a senator. There had not been a challenge to the presidential vote in Congress for over a century, and it was recognition of the failures and disenfranchisement in Ohio. Has the senator signed the objection? The senator has signed the objection. An objection presented in writing and signed by both a representative and a senator complies with the law. I raise this objection because I am convinced that we as a body must conduct a formal and legitimate debate about election irregularities. I raise this objection to debate the process and protect the integrity of the true will of the people. When I made a decision in conjunction with Senator Barbara Boxer to object to the Ohio vote, you would have thought that I shot somebody in the head and that I wanted something, uh, that I did something terrible. The problem we confront with this debate is that it serves to plant the insidious seeds of doubt in the electoral process. They accuse the president, who we are told is apparently a closet computer nerd, of personally overseeing the development of vote-stealing software. We also were all elected under the same rules and regulations that we're discussing today. I don't know that we helped the process. I don't know that we helped the process by casting doubt on what all of those people that work at elections all over America do. Those favoring yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number has arisen. The A's and A's are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic vote. Although the Ohio election was certified by Congress, politicians had been forced to look at a system that served themselves and not the people. Tragically, around the same time, Andy Stevenson was diagnosed with cancer. He died in July. Maybe this is the legacy I'll leave. Maybe I'll leave this behind for people to remember me so that when I, when I do go, when my time comes to, to meet my maker, I'll have something, that, a little piece that I left behind that, that people can point and say, well, yeah, he was here. In Tallahassee, Florida, the supervisor of elections, Ion Sancho, wanted to be absolutely sure that when his computers declared a winner, it was because that was the will of the people. The vendors have entirely too much power in the elections arena today. Election officials are really overly dependent upon the vendors. Vendors control what kind of technology may be offered in a state. We're essentially hostage to the financial desires of private interests to conduct the most public of our procedures, public elections. Ion asked Black Box Voting to look at his Diebold optical scan system, and they invited computer security uh, expert slides. Hari Hursty from Australia, Finland. From this is a first. We're going to be looking at uh, the machines, the real machines. That's a real system that's actually been used in real elections. So this is exciting. Welcome to Tallahassee. Oh, Hi. Thanks. I rehearsed. Nice to meet you. I am Sancho. Harry. This is where we count the votes on election night. It's Thomas James. Thomas? How are you doing? Pretty fine. Hey, One of the things that the vendor told us was that people would not be able to access this. That, that every time you entered into the system, that the system would record that. Dr. Hugh Thompson and Hari Hursty believed that they could change vote totals without being caught. Hugh tried hacking GEMS, the computer's vote counting program. He used an election held at a local high school. Nadia Smith had come in second with 322 votes. They decided to make her the winner. So I go into this election file. 
And if I do, I'm asked for a password, and I have no idea what the password is. But Hugh had written a program that automatically looked for Nadia's vote total and then changed it to 5,000. When they called up the results page, Nadia had won, but the computer showed no evidence of fraud. It does give me great concern over the failure of the system to realize that you can slide by and come around through another direction and bypass the password. But Hugh could have been caught if the final totals on gems were checked against the original printed out results. Hari realized that every vote is stored on a memory card before the totals are printed. So if you can hack the memory cards, you can control an election. The real vulnerability has to be very, very close to the source of the information. Um, in the, that environment, the only possibility was the memory card. Hari wanted to find out what exactly was inside the Diebold ballot box. Yeah. And so he bought a memory card reader off the internet. And within a couple of days, he found that the cards didn't just contain votes. There was a program or executable code. Well, if someone would have told me that in this system, there is a living thing, an executable, modifiable program stored in the same place as the very data, which is the most secure in this system, I would say, you have to be misunderstanding something crazy or lying. Hari wrote a report for black box voting, warning that this program lurking in the memory card could be used to change the result of an election. What happened after that was that Diebold basically dismissed and stonewalled the report. Diebold sent letters to officials across America denying that there was any executable code on the memory cards. Back in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, home of the infamous recount, the chair of the Board of Elections, Bob Bennett, was on the brink of investing $20 million in Diebold systems. It's a standalone system, votes are encrypted, so if anyone tries to tamper with those election results, immediately shuts down the system. So you've got built-in protection within the system. I'm sorry, you've been very kind. No. Right. So far, you're doing fairly well. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Bob Bennett was also the chair of the Republican Party in Ohio, the party that Diebold had raised money for. Citizens were there to record, observe, and hopefully make a difference. Among them, Kathleen and her college buddy, Victoria Lovegren. Basically, I would like to know why, what were your decision rationale? For even your own criterion, Diebold does not win. Well, it's a bad decision, and it's going to, you know, you're going to, it's going to come back to bite you because you're already in trouble. People do not trust Cuyahoga County. They do not trust the recount here. You're in trouble. Right now, we are still in the process of completing the negotiations on the Diebold contract. We have made that selection. It's not likely that we're going to go back unless there's something drastic that happens in that and change our decision on that. So Bev decided it was time to make something drastic happen. Three months later, Diebold was back in town to complete the sale. Knowing that Diebold was going to be showing up at a public meeting, the next strategy was to go there and get their head engineer on videotape saying, you can't change the votes on the memory card. So my question for Diebold would be, again, either do you not know what was done in these security tests, or did you just tell something that's not true? I think that deserves a response from Diebold. Harris's question. Well, the question was mind. changing votes, and did they know or not? It is my understanding that because there is no executable, executable excuse me, program on the memory card, 
that the actual loads on the memory card cannot be altered. Could you remind us, are you an engineer yourself? No, I am not an engineer, but I can work with our engineering crew. In fact, Pat, you want to step up here for one second? Hi, I'm Pat Green. I'm Director of uh, Research and Development for Eagle. Okay. Ms. Ms. Harris, could you um, phrase your question again? Can votes be changed using only a memory card? No, I do not believe votes can be changed using only a memory card. That particular situation is detected by the software. Uh, the, the report uh, that was written that I have read guesses that something like that might be possible, but says that they did not actually accomplish that or even test that. These are very strong statements. These are statements that we took to be a challenge. These are statements that we wanted to find out if they were true or not. And so Bev went back to Tallahassee to see if votes could be changed. For Ion, there was another reason to test the memory cards. As one of the most trusted Florida election officials, he had been appointed to oversee the 2000 presidential recount. The recount might have discovered why Volusia County's computers counted backwards to minus 16,022 votes. But when the Supreme Court stopped that recount, Ian was left with unanswered questions. One of the reasons that interests me about the Volusia County situation and what happened there is that we in Leon County used the identical voting system. The Diebold AccuVote 2000, and in the 17 years that I've been an election administrator, um, my experience is that that kind of subtraction cannot occur accidentally. Someone consciously tried to affect that computer system and consciously tried to perpetuate a fraud, to steal votes. During his research, Harry had discovered that Diebold's memory cards effectively allowed negative votes. Not them, no dead. What we're going to do here is modify one card and then bring it to the election supervisor Ayer Sanchez office. Plug it as the real card in any election to the real election system and run ballots through. And that's the same system which have been used in a number of previous elections. And we'll see that what is the power in the ballot box. This should be just an empty box containing the votes, but it has more capabilities than that. So it's a very simple process. You just add the card in. You run the rewrite program, tell where to find the scanner, and tell exactly what file you want to be put in, and off it goes. Harry's hack is a variation on stuffing the ballot box before anyone has voted. But this is always suspicious because you end up with more votes than voters. So Harry used five negative votes for one candidate and then gave the other one five positive votes. So as people cast their ballots, the total number of votes always equals the total number of voters. But was Harry right? Black box voting went back to Tallahassee for the ultimate test. Bev asked Susan Pynchon from Volusia County to observe. She too had found evidence of problems with the memory cards while sifting the trash from the Volusia County Board of Elections. This is from Mark Early of Diebold, and it says, how did the number of memory card failures on election day increase from the 17 reported on November 3rd to 25? I don't know if we'll ever know why these memory cards failed or if, see, see one of the big questions in my mind is, did they actually fail? Or could they have been used for other purposes? Hi, Hi how are you doing, Hi, nice Susan? To see you. Good to Hi, see you. Good to see you. Susan Berniker from Louisiana and Dr. Hugh Thompson also came to watch Harry's hack. Good to see you. Always good to Always see you. Always good to see you, Kathleen. <laughs> Come on in. Well, let me tell you what we're going to do today. 
we have constructed a mini election, uh, but Harry Hersey, as you have served as a technical advisor of how to do this, we're going to ask you to remain outside. After you, let me introduce you to my election staff. To ensure that we've not prepared some sort of a, a device that has been pre-rigged, pick the number and then we'll grab that unit and that will be the device that we will count the ballots on. I just feel like this is the one. The winner. Okay, and the winner is unit 15191. What we have here is a programmed optical scan ballot. Uh, there is only one question on this ballot. Can the votes on the Diebold system be hacked using the memory card? I have only touched the memory card, not the other parts of the Diebold election system, which is going to be used today. Only the memory card. And uh, I, I can certainly speak for myself and Harry and that we're going to vote yes. All right, then let's have the rest of us vote no. Okay. Two individuals, okay. Hugh and Harry, will be voting yes. The rest of us will be voting no. And then we'll scrutinize the ballots afterwards to ensure that that is indeed the mark. I will say that I'm wrong and Diebold is right. And I'm going to say uh, no, they cannot be hacked. It's impossible. So I vote no. I'm going to film myself voting. Excuse me. I'm going to mark this ballot no. Okay. Dr. Thompson? I am going to bar this ballot yes. I've seen some pretty concerning things. Well, it's down to you. You're the last voter, Harry. All right. I think it could be. So I vote for yes. You will be the second yes. All right. I am here is the memory card I have touched. OK. Now, this is the only piece of Diebold equipment that you've used. That's correct. Well, thank you. Let me take your ballot in. <laughs> this card will go into this slot. The next activity that the election worker does on the morning of the election is turn the machine on, making it live to receive votes. When you do that, this machine will produce what is called a zero total tape. The machine is going through a self-test analysis, and then it will spontaneously turn on. This is Harry's card that is telling us that there are zero votes stored in the memory. Okay, let me get the ballots. Let's insert a yes ballot. We're going to put in another no. Seven. And the last no ballot, eight. Placing the ender card in this device and telling it to turn off its counting function and do its reporting function will now cause the voting machine to print out a tape reading the number of votes that it had just read. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> oh, oh no. What is it? What is it? Seven yes, one no. Oh, oh my God. Here's the tape. Seven people said it could be hacked. But and we put through six and two. Six, six no's, no's and two, two yes. yes. Oh my gosh, do you know what this means? How do we know that Hari didn't just change the report and the votes themselves on the memory card are still correct? If that was the case, when they go into GEMS, the results would be different, isn't that right? I mean, the only way to know that is to read them into GEMS and to check and the vote totals. See what Jim says. So should we do that? I think we should, because I want to confirm mm -hmm. for my own analysis, is this just a superficial 
Right. That's a good, that's a good question. Words, did we just change the words on this paper? And we will upload this memory card. If I had not seen what was behind this, um, I'd have no reason not to. I would have certified this election as a true and accurate result of a vote. secure and they're being called conspiracy theorists and technophobes and these vendors are lying and saying that everything's all right and it's not all right and I'm crying because heart it's a quote somebody that I know who said that our cut it's as though our country is one country pretending to be another country how can this be happening to our elections This really does affect me. I, I don't know exactly how to describe what, what I saw here. Um, I think we, as election officials, need to be a little bit more demanding from the vendors as to the technical specifications of this equipment. The vendors are driving the process of voting technology in the United States. I would much rather, at this point, I think, focus on allowing citizens to select technology that satisfies their needs. Diebold accused Ion of foolishness and apparent negligence, insisting that only authorized people should test their systems for security. They said that the hack was equivalent to leaving your car unlocked with the windows down and keys left in the ignition. But scientists at Berkeley University later confirmed Hari's findings they discovered a further 16 security flaws in Diebold's touchscreen machines. ES&S and Sequoia claimed their systems were safe, and Diebold maintains that they have upgraded their software to make it even more secure. They also insist that their electronic voting systems are still more accurate than their predecessors. But now, everyone is asking, why can votes be altered without leaving a trace? Cuyahoga, however, did not change their minds after the hearings and spent $22 million on touchscreen and optical scan machines from Diebold. <laughs> 